Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Mythgard Academy. This is session number 16 of Alice's Adventures, and tonight we get to Humpty Dumpty, uh, which is always one of the things I look forward to. Humpty Dumpty is not my favorite character in Through the Looking Glass, but this chapter is definitely <clears throat> a highlight uh, that I am looking forward to very much. Um, and we got right up to it at the end of last time. So you remember that at the end of the previous chapter, chapter five, the wool and water chapter, uh, she was in this, this strange dream sequence, which was interestingly called a dream sequence. It was made explicit within the text um, that this was that this was at least like a dream. Uh, now, of course, that idea has been planted already, uh, even for Alice herself within the story, um, with Tweedledum and Tweedledee's accusations that she was only just a thing um, in the Red King's dream, right, as she was watching the Red King sleep. Uh, so th that what is happening is a dream has been made explicit, as was not, you know, done so at the beginning of the narrative, right? Um, we got a, uh, a, a more, I think, uncertain kind of introduction to this book in terms of what the narrative frame was. We just had Alice talking to her kitten, and then she um, was deciding to go through the looking glass, and then she up and does it, right? So there was no kind of transitional moment where like perhaps she had fallen asleep or something like that. There was a little bit more of that at the beginning of Alice in Wonderland, I think, right before she sees the white rabbit. They're like out, you know, on like a picnic and she's settling down. And, um, you know, it's not made explicit and very clear that she is falling asleep at that moment. But there's at least in retrospect, a kind of occasion on which she was falling asleep. Right. Um, and it, 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 you know, when she returns, especially, it begins to kind of make sense as a dream. Um, we didn't get anything, I think, very similar to that here. Um, and what was really blurring the lines between potential dream sequence and reality was Alice's pretending. Remember the emphasis on her pretending, um, all the way, all the way through. Um, is it a little bit dreamlike the way that she was sort of having a conversation with her kitten? Uh, well, no, it was just her pretending, right? Her pretending that the kitten was talking back to her, which segued directly to pretending that uh, she could see into Looking Glass House, right? And then going into it. Um, so this was another reason why uh, when we met the Red King, and Tweedledum and Tweedledee raised the prospect of Alice being just a thing in his dream. Um, it was interesting because it was kind of raising that issue, really, for the first time. Though, of course, in some ways we should have been anticipating it, having had it already in Alice in Wonderland, right? Um, anyway, so all of that stuff kind of comes up again, especially there at the end of, uh, of Wool and Water. Um, when sudden transitions happen when she crosses one of the brooks, <clears throat> one of the brooks, which are, of course, the the sort of horizontal boundaries, right, between the chess squares, um, that there is a jump, you know, when all of those uh, asterisks come in um, and a sudden change in scene or action or something like that. Um, that's not surprising. It seems to be part of the frame, right, of this uh, of this of this story, of what we're seeing. Um but before that, the way that everything, you know, that her suddenly finding herself in the shop and then the shop's transformations and everything, again, explicitly compared to a dream. But then, of course, she remember rather than paying less for two eggs because she wasn't sh at all, wasn't sure that the egg would be at all nice. Um, and if she bought two for tuppence, she would have to have uh, eaten both eggs. Uh, and she wasn't sure that she wanted to do that. So she just bought the one egg, not being sure if it was nice. And then she wasn't, the the sheep refused to hand it to her and set it up across the room and made her go towards it. And that's when things began to change and the furniture becomes trees. And she expected the egg itself to become a tree, but it didn't. Uh, and of course, in the end, turns into Humpty Dumpty. So just a reminder of where we are and kind of what was at stake there. So... We get to Humpty Dumpty, 
Um, and this is now the second time, uh, second to Tweedledum and Tweedledee, of course, um, when we have a nursery rhyme looming over the narrative action here, and Alice feels it, right? However, the egg only got larger and larger and more and more human. When she had come within a few yards of it, she saw that it had eyes and a nose and mouth. And when she had come close to it, she saw clearly that it was Humpty Dumpty himself. It can't be anybody else, she said to herself. I'm as certain of it as if his name were written all over his face. It might have been written a hundred times easily on that enormous face. Humpty Dumpty was sitting with his legs crossed like a Turk on the top of a high wall, such a narrow one that Alice quite wondered how he could keep his balance. And as his eyes were steadily fixed in the opposite direction, and he didn't take the least notice of her, she thought she must be a, she thought he must be a stuffed figure after all. And how exactly like an egg he is, she said aloud, standing with her hands ready to catch him, for she was every moment expecting him to fall. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, Queen Swan White, it's an excellent question. Um, why is Humpty Dumpty in all caps? Um, yes, that his name would have capital letters, capital H, capital D, um, wouldn't be surprising at all. Um, the assertion of the names in all caps, um, it's, it seems to me, uh, Queen Swan White, almost as if what we're getting there is like an anticipation of, you know, she says, I'm as certain of it as if his name were written all over his face, that his name might be printed in all caps like that um, on a sign, right? Or on a, on his eggy forehead or whatever um, might have, uh, might not be surprising, right? So to some extent, it's almost like an anticipation of the sign that she is imagining being there. There isn't one there, right? Um, or uh, to say a similar thing another way, it's almost like the all caps name is, is, is like a sort of caption, right? Or she's imagining it almost as a sort of caption, uh, you know, labeling the egg in her own mind, at least. I don't know of any other convention that would necessarily... Um, uh, that would necessarily lead to the all capsification of his name, right? Um, uh, in a context like this, um, unless it's uh... no, I wouldn't think even if it were the title of the nursery rhyme, and therefore kind of a, an, an allusion back to not just his name, but to the title of the nursery rhyme. I wouldn't think that would be in all caps. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but I wouldn't think so. Um, Mighty Felix is, is a great question. If she thinks he's a stuffed figure, should she pay for the privilege of looking at him? Well, you pay to, to see waxworks. I'm not sure about stuffed figures. That, that might be, um, it might be a, a kind of a neutral ground there. Not, not really, uh, not really sure. Um, but, um, Anyway, okay, so there's Humpty Dumpty on the wall. And we get lots of references to this. Unlike with Tweedledum and Tweedledee, she does not first thing recite their poem. Right? That's what she did with Tweedledum and Tweedledee before she even did anything else. She like compulsively recites the poem probably aloud. We don't get that with Humpty Dumpty, but it is clear that this is what Alice is thinking about, right? That's made explicit. He is sitting on top of a high wall. We know what's coming. We know what the future holds. It is as certain as anything in Looking Glass World that Humpty Dumpty is going to fall off that wall. Alice knows it, right? It is prophesied. It is destined. And she has seen with Tweedledum and Tweedledee how the destiny of these nursery rhymes comes true. Um, no sooner did she call for the monstrous crow or, uh, you know, look about for the monstrous crow, but it showed up, right, with Tweedledum and Tweedledee. Um, and here she is the more alarmed, right? Notice how she is observing things that are not made explicit in the nursery rhyme. For instance, why does Humpty Dumpty fall off the wall? 
what leads to Humpty Dumpty falling off? Well, what she sees is Humpty Dumpty. First, she sees how narrow the high wall is. You know, she quite wonders how he could keep his balance. And he's balancing there with his legs crossed. Uh, you know, again, as if to maximize the difficulty of balancing on top of the wall. Um, and she's standing with her hands ready to catch him, for she was every moment expecting him to fall. She knows what's going to happen. And um, notice another thing. One of the things that sort of misleads her about her encounter with Humpty Dumpty, um, the premise of the Humpty Dumpty nursery rhyme is his fall off the wall, right? He was Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. So he is up on the wall first and then falls off. Um, but the action of the nurse, that's not the culmination of the story. That's the premise that he's at first, he's on a wall and then he falls off. And when he falls off, here's what happens, you know, with all the King's horses and all the King's men. Um, so she's expecting the first thing that's going to happen, right? What's going to kick off the action here in this square, right? In this sequence is the tumbling of Humpty Dumpty off the wall. Um, and therefore she's hoping to prevent that. She doesn't want the egg uh, to come falling off and to shatter. Um, Mighty Felix, exactly. Notice, uh, uh, Mighty Felix says, just like the White Queen knew she was about to prick her finger. Exactly. Notice how the intervention of the White Queen in between Tweedledum and Tweedledee and now changes things. Alice was Alice has the conversation with the White Queen in which she says confu with some confusion that her memory only works towards things backwards and the White Queen is like, oh, that's a um, uh, a slow sort of memory. Isn't that, isn't that what she calls it? Slow sort of memory. But the irony is, though we didn't talk about this last time, we've just seen Alice's memory working both forwards and backwards. She does remember what's going to happen in the future with Tweedledum and Tweedledee, in fact. And her memory of what happens in the future guides her conversation with them and her expectations, and we see it again here. She is remembering ahead what is going to happen to Humpty Dumpty, which is why she's standing there with her hands ready to catch him, expecting him to fall. So yes, it is fascinating, isn't it, Mighty Felix, that having introduced that in the middle. He has sandwiched that passage with the White Queen with these two passages in which Alice is in fact remembering what is going to happen in the future uh, because she knows these poems, because she knows these, these nursery rhymes. Um, yes, so the anticipation is keen, and she doesn't know... Um, she doesn't know... If uh, if he's even alive or not, she thought he must be a stuffed figure. Uh, she clearly was preparing when she saw that it was Humpty Dumpty himself. She seems to have assumed, believed that he would be a person with whom she could converse as, you know, has almost everything else she's met, including the flowers. So, um, but then when he doesn't take any notice of her and is his eyes are steadily fixed in the opposite direction of her approach, she thinks he must be a stuffed figure. Um, and this, of course, leads to... Uh, leads to great offense, right? Um, she... Um, Humpty Dumpty is offended at being called an egg. It's a most provoking thing to be called an egg, she is told. And she apologizes. Um, Alice didn't know what to say to this. Um, he just said that she had no more sense than a baby. Um, Alice didn't know what to say to this. It wasn't at all like conversation, she thought. 
as he never said anything to her. In fact, his last remark was evidently addressed to a tree. So she stood and softly repeated to herself, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty in his place again. That last line is much too long for the poetry, she added, almost out loud, forgetting that Humpty Dumpty would hear her. So here she's explicitly saying the poem to herself. She's not reciting it where Humpty Dumpty can hear. She does uh, almost make her poetic criticism out loud. Um, but she does seem to remember uh, at the last, you know, at the last second, not to say it out loud where he can hear. After the initial awkward exchange in which she calls the egg an egg and the egg is offended by this um, and then insults her <clears throat> by calling her a baby, having no more sense than a baby. Um, and it's interesting to note the parallel between egg and baby, right? Um, is that why Humpty Dumpty is offended by being called an egg? Because um, he's not an infant. He's a, you know, a sophisticated ovine person, um, but um, in any case, uh, they are speaking at cross purposes, and he is speaking crossly, what is more, and her response to this is to stand and softly repeat the nursery rhyme to herself, as if she's trying to, what, contextualize what is going on, right, to review what to expect. Um, what's the joke about the poetry, do you think? Why is it? What do you think is important about the fact that through Alice's reflection there at the end of the verse. Lewis Carroll is drawing our attention to the bad poetry of at least this version of the nursery rhyme. What should it be? What's the problem with that last line? Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty in his place again. She's quite right. That last line is much too long for the poetry. Yeah. Um, notice the patterns, right? We should be good at this by now. We've been doing this a lot. You hear how this poem works? The first two lines don't have actually a regular meter, but instead they have a sort of idiosyncratic rhythm, which is nevertheless very consistent between the first two lines. Humpty Dumpty, which is a very trochaic name. Stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed. And then sat on a wall. Stressed, unstressed, unstressed, stressed. Bump, bump, bump. Bum, 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 bum. Right? Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. Exactly the same rhythm in both of those two lines. Then we get a modulation. All the king's horses and all the king's men. What's going on there? How does that line work? How does that line work? All the king's horses and all the king's men. It slips into anapest, basically. We start with a stress on the first syllable, but then after that, we've got... Um, after the first syllable, we have, a per we have perfect anapestic feet, right? All 
the king's horses and all the king's men. We have a stress at the end of each, at the either end of the line, which, by the way, kind of fits the overall pattern. Notice that the um, you've got the trochaic Humpty Dumpty name, and then the latter half of those first two lines form that same kind of pattern: stressed, unstressed, unstressed, stressed, right? Um, and the whole third line begins and ends with a stress in the same way, right? And then alternates. It's, it's sort of, it's like taking that, la that rhythm of the last part, the second half of the first two lines, and playing that rhythm out again and again throughout the line. All the king's horses and all the king's men. Right? Um, exactly the same shape. couldn't put Humpty Dumpty in his place again. Not only is that too long, as Alice says, it's uh, pretty horrible, right? I mean, it completely comes apart. Except it starts promisingly. Couldn't put hump, right? The couldn't put hump is perfect. That's just how it should start. Just like all the king's horse. Um, yeah. But then Humpty Dumpty's name, you can't just do Humpty Dumpty there. That trochaic meter trips it all up. And then in his place again, no way. In his place is not bad, unstressed, unstressed, stressed. But then again, unstressed, stressed, little I am at the end, nah, doesn't fit. Doesn't fit. So we can, we can figure how to fix that, right? I've seen several good suggestions here. Um, uh, JJ, I think that's you. It is. Um, sorry, JJ, it's the same problem I always have with seeing your comments, that your name shows up on my screen as royal blue on navy blue, and I can't <laughs> ever read it. Like that vaguely blue name, which is often you. Um, but anyway, um, uh, JJ's suggestion was couldn't put Humpty together again. Couldn't put Humpty together again. That works, right? That works. Um, couldn't put Humpty together again. Exactly. And that's what I was pretty sure I was remembering, too, from when I were in the nursery rhyme. Um, and that fits the meter. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Perfect. Perfect rhythm. Alice is misremembering the poem. Now, Alice misremembering poetry was a whole subgenre in Alice in Wonderland, right? Every single poem she attempted to recite to herself was an adventure and kept coming out wrong. That's not been the case in Looking Glass Land. Almost ironically actually. Um, I mean, uh, we will see later on in this chapter that she is in fact able accurately to recite the opening stanza of Jabberwocky, which she's only just read the once. Um, so she's doing quite well. Uh, and even though it was a strange poem, it comes out quite right. Tweedledum and Tweedledee was fine. Most of Humpty Dumpty here is fine. But she doesn't get the last line right. Um, and she gets the king's horses and the king's men right. In fact, she gets just enough of the poem to make sure that we can feel the bad rhythm of that last line, right? Once you get the rhythm of the poem in your head, that last line should jar you like fingernails down a chalkboard. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty in his place again. Horrible. I mean, you have to be half deaf not to hear that that line is horrible, rhythmically, compared to the last one, right? Um, Alice seems to be misremembering the poem. Um, she is not... She remembers the general sense, but she does not remember the words. Um, she does not remember the, uh, the, the, the right way that it's supposed to finish up. Um, <clears throat> now there's a 
kind of joke here, right? Um, that is Alice's version of the Humpty Dumpty poem also falls apart and fails to be put back together again, right? At the end, it rhythmically, uh, uh, metrically falls to pieces in the fourth line. Um, so that's, um, that's fun. Oh, and Edith, by the way, sorry, I had meant to say, I, I, you're completely right. Um, that, uh, all the king's horses and all the king's men has a very galloping rhythm. Um, yeah, yeah, it absolutely does. Um, with the, for the horses and men, right. Which is very, which is very appropriate. Um, but then we just get chaos in the last line. Uh, and the chaos in which Humpty Dumpty has failed to be put back together again, except she doesn't even talk about putting him together again. She talks about him being put in his place again, um, which is interesting because that has a couple different potential meanings. On the one hand, couldn't put him in his place again in the sense of putting him back up on top of the wall. Um, but I wonder if it could also mean uh, putting in his place in a different sense. Um, she misremembers the poem. Her forward-going memory uh, does not... fails her here. Keep this in mind. Well, it won't come up at the end of this chapter, chapter six, but it will come up at the beginning of chapter seven. So don't forget about this Alice's uh, little poetic mishap here when we get uh, when we get to chapter seven. Um, okay. Alice is attempting to start a conversation with him. Why do you sit out here all alone? said Alice, not wishing to begin an argument. Why, because there's nobody with me, cried Humpty Dumpty. Did you think I didn't know the answer to that? Ask another. Don't you think you'd be safer down on the ground? Alice went on, not with any idea of making another riddle, but simply in her good-natured anxiety for the queer creature. That wall is so very narrow. What tremendously easy riddles you ask, Humpty Dumpty growled out. Of course I don't think so. Why, if ever I did fall off, which there's no chance of, but if I did, here he pursed his lips and looked so solemn and grand that Alice could hardly help laughing. If I did fall, he went on, the king has promised me, ah, you may turn pale if you like. You didn't think I was going to say that, did you? The king has promised me, with his very own mouth, to, to, to send all his horses and all his men, Alice interrupted, rather unwisely. Um, okay, so we have seen lots of this sort of thing, that is, the openings of conversational gambits being twisted and turned around by a conversational partner who is not interested in playing along uh, with your social conventions, right? Um, Alice is putting forth a topic of conversation. I have come into the middle of the woods and I find a random wall and you sitting on top of it for some reason. Explain this to me. How do you come to be here balancing on top of the tall, narrow wall in the middle of the woods? Right. This is clearly what Alice is trying to do. Humpty Dumpty chooses to take her words in a particular way, a fairly aggressive way, actually, right? As if the question she is asking to prompt him to tell her his story were a riddle she was trying to stump him with, which he then mocks her for. Did you think I didn't know the answer to that? You see how his premise is from the start that the two of them are competitors. Ask another. And Alice proceeds on again, sort of naively. Um, because she's so worried about him. Don't you think you'd be safer down on the ground? Of course I don't think so, is the answer to the question. That's the proper answer. Um, what the tremendously easy riddles you ask, he taunts her. Um, okay. Okay, uh, so 
we see something about his frame of mind, right? The way that he thinks uh, when he, um, uh, yeah. Now, Taronio, we have had something like this cross purposes riddles game before, but it was the other way around, right? Yeah, exactly. As Taronio says, um, uh, why is a raven like a writing desk? Um, and she thought it was a riddle to which there was an answer that she would be told, and like they had no idea why a raven was like a writing desk, right? Um, and so it turned out not exactly to be a riddle before. That's being flipped around on her now where she's, again, asking conversational gambit questions, or even in the case of her second question, a question of concern for Humpty Dumpty's well-being, um, and he is treating them as if they were riddles, and ridiculously easy riddles at that, right? Um, yeah. He does take her up on her second question, right? Um, he answers the question, of course I don't think so. Um, but then he does talk about him being on the wall. There's no chance that he's going to fall off. But if I did, if I did fall, He makes a big... So, Humpty Dumpty makes a, a tremendously big deal of two things here. One, the enormous unlikelihood of his falling off the wall. The one thing which we as readers, and Alice as mostly accurate rememberer of, of nursery rhymes, knows for a fact is going to happen. Right When we meet Humpty Dumpty perched on a wall the one narrative reality on which we can count absolutely is that Humpty Dumpty is going to sooner or later fall off the wall, right? And so, but here's Humpty Dumpty emphasizing the certainty, right? The irony of the certainty of our forward-going memory. Notice again, coming back to the point that Mighty Felix, the excellent point Mighty Felix was making earlier on, Alice was very confused when talking to the White Queen, and the White Queen was trying to explain how cause and effect works backwards here, and how her memory works backwards. And we got that illustrated by her pricking her finger uh, with the pin, as well as discussed in the issue of uh, crime and punishment, um, you know, looking glass land style. Now the shoe is on the other foot. Now it is she and Humpty Dumpty that are talking at cross purposes because she knows what is going to come. Um, and he does not. And is telling her, just as she was concerned about justice um, for the king's messenger, who was being punished prior to his trial, and which was itself prior to his crime, um, here Humpty Dumpty is scoffing at the idea, at her concern for his, the prospect of his falling off the wall. And the second thing, of course, that he emphasizes is what a very big deal, right? He name drops the king here, right? The king has promised me, you know, you may turn pale if you like. You didn't think I was going to say that, did you? But of course, we know exactly that he was going to say that. Alice knows he was going to say that. She anticipates what he's going to say to send all his horses and all his men. She knows just exactly what is going on here, despite the fact that he is speaking as if he believes her to be wholly, you know, flustered and surprised by this revelation. Um, so, okay. Let's keep going. 
Yes, all his horses and all his men. So Humpty Dumpty is initially offended again, right? Um, offended again because he's like, what were you? You've been listening at keyholes or like, you know, how did you, how did you learn this? Like you couldn't have known that the king had told me that he would send all his horses and all his men. Um, and Alice says she read it in a book, which satisfies him, right? That's what you call a history of England, that is. And that juxtaposition, the juxtaposition between a history of England and the nursery rhyme book, it reminds me of the Red Queen's comment about something being as sensible as a dictionary. Um, the I, a book called the history a, a history of England is um, you know pretty far along the uh, sense and nonsense axis you know uh, a spectrum um, not quite maybe at the dictionary point but in that direction obviously right that's sort of how Humpty Dumpty seems to take it um, but of course the reality is quite different from that the reality is nursery rhymes which are mostly a good deal closer to the nonsense end of the sense nonsense spectrum right certainly than the history of england is and so once again alice and humpty dumpty are at cross purposes he has a completely different view of himself of his importance of the sense of what's going on um of the you know his own well he has a different sense of his own position Alice has a sense of his position, which he believes to be precarious and doomed to fall, right? But Humpty Dumpty forgives her again. Yes, all his horses and all his men, Humpty Dumpty went on. They'd pick me up again in a minute, they would. However, this conversation is going on a little too fast. Let's go back to the last remark but one. They'd pick me up again in a minute, they would. It is certain that the arrival of all the king's horses and all the king's men, in the unlikely event that he should fall off the wall, the arrival of all the king's horses and all the king's men would surely solve the problem, right? They'd pick me up again in a minute. They would. This would be a trivial challenge for all the king's horses and all the king's men. When, once again, we know that to be contrary to fact, we are remembering ahead what's actually going to happen. Although Alice only remembered it fuzzily and got the poetry wrong. Um, but Humpty Dumpty says, this conversation is going on a little too fast. Let's go back to the last remark, but one. I'm afraid I can't quite remember it, Alice said very politely. In that case, we start afresh, said Humpty Dumpty, and it's my turn to choose a subject. He talks about it just as if it was a game, thought Alice. So here's a question for you. How old did you say you were? Alice made a short calculation and said, Seven years and six months. Wrong! Humpty Dumpty exclaimed triumphantly. You never said a word like it. I, I thought you meant how old are you? Alice explained. If I'd meant that, I'd have said it, said Humpty Dumpty. Alice didn't want to begin another argument, so she said nothing. <laughs> now, Humpty Dumpty says something that sounds like a conversational gambit, raising a topic to invite her to tell him something about herself, which is just what she was doing in her questions to him, which he was taking as if they were riddles. Except when she answers politely, responding to his question um, with the apparent, you know, uh, will and intention of you know, beginning and carrying on the conversation that he seems to be inviting there, um, Alice, or uh, he scores a point on her instead, because actually it was a riddle. It sounded like a conversational gambit. It sounds exactly like a conversational gambit. How old did you say you were? Is exactly what somebody might say. But technically, he, of course, is quite right. She did not say how old she was. And so he got her, right? Um, this always reminds me of uh, uh, of the game Simon Says, 
right? Uh, when you're supposed to follow commands, but only if they're prefaced by the phrase Simon says. Uh, and so if you follow a command that uh, doesn't have that, you're wrong. You know, you're in the wrong, even though you're supposed to obey the commands generally. Um, a similar kind of like, I'm trying to trip you up. I'm trying to, I'm trying to trick you. Um, so again, he's completely reversed. Um, what, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and Mighty Felix, you were right again. Um, she did, in fact, say that she was seven and a half years old. She said that to the White Queen. Remember, she said she was seven and a half years old exactly. And the Queen says, you needn't say exactly. I can believe you without that. Um, so she did, in fact, say how old she was. But not to Humpty Dumpty. Um, and, of course, she didn't say it in exactly those words anyway. She said seven years and a half, not seven years and six months. Um, so Humpty Dumpty would have gotten her anyway, because it's not exactly, in fact, what she said. But Alice hadn't been expecting a quiz. So we can see, what do we see about Humpty Dumpty's use of language? This tendency to literalize the language and by literalizing it to draw attention to precise turns of phrase. How old did you say you were? You know, how, like, how or what blank did you say? You know, uh, that is, it's not a literal question generally. It is a prompting to say, right? Um, but his playing of this particular game, this game that was, um, you know, played by, uh, uh, has been played by many, in fact, right? Um, it's been played by, uh, uh, the, you know, the Mad Hatter and the March Hare, for sure, right? And others as well, um, even here in Looking Glass Land. Humpty Dumpty plays it rather aggressively. Um, and he's keeping score, right? He is, uh, uh, he is, Humpty Dumpty is competitive. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, right, JJ, exactly. What did you say your name was? Is, uh, a very, is a classic way to ask somebody to say their name, right? Right? Um, yes, yes. Um, Yes, exactly, Mighty Felix. He is making the whole conversation into a competition. Yes. Yes. Um, Alice finally says nothing because she doesn't want to begin another argument. She doesn't want to compete. She doesn't want to argue. She's just trying to have a conversation. And, of course, she was also trying to help and protect him because she knows he's going to fall off the wall. Um... He then speaks, so then comes uh, Alice's choice of the conversational topic in which she compliments his belt, but then can't figure out whether it's a belt or a cravat and puts her foot in it, right? Um, and uh, Humpty Dumpty eventually, after making her feel guilty again, um, it's a most provoking thing, he says, um, when someone can't tell a belt from a cravat. Because, um, of course, he has no neck. Like he has no body. He's an egg. But he was offended by being called an egg. Mentions that he gets, he got his cravat, because um, it is a cravat, um, as an unbirthday present. And Alice says that she prefers birthday presents to unbirthday presents, and he says that he, um, that she's wrong there. Um, because she has far more opportunities to get unbirthday presents as birthday presents. Um, and so he asks how many uh, how many days are there, you know, how many birthdays do you have in a year? And she says one. And he says, how many unbirthdays do you have? And she says 364. Uh, and so he, but he needs to see that he challenges that he needs to see it done on paper. So she writes out the sum for him. 365 minus one equals 364. And he's looking it over and, um, you know, figuring out whether it's correct. He's not very good at math, Humpty Dumpty, apparently. Um, but that's okay. He has other strengths, as we will see. 
You're holding it upside down, Alice interrupted. To be sure I was, Humpty Dumpty said gaily as she turned it round for him. I thought it looked a little queer. As I was saying, that seems to be done right, though I haven't time to look it over thoroughly just now. And that shows that there are 364 days when you might get unbirthday presents. Certainly, said Alice. And only one for birthday presents, you know. There's glory for you. I don't know what you mean by glory, Alice said. Humpty Dumpty smiled contemptuously. Of course you don't, till I tell you. I meant there's a nice knockdown argument for you. But glory doesn't mean a nice knockdown argument, Alice objected. When I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said, in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. The question is, said Humpty Dumpty, which is to be master, that's all. We are coming to Tolkien's favorite part of uh, Through the Looking Glass. Okay. Um, uh, and I, for the record, um, this is my favorite sub slide subtitle uh, of the entire Alice class so far. Um, for those of you who are listening in audio form, uh, my subtitle is None Has Understood Him Yet, for Humpty is the Master. Um, anyway, he is the master of words. Notice the way this all kind of comes together. Alice protests that the word, she doesn't understand his usage of glory. There's glory for you. And she's like, what do you mean by glory? Um, he's using this word in what seems to Alice a rather unconventional way. And he says with contempt, with a contemptuous smile, of course you don't know what I mean by it till I tell you. And then he does condescend to tell her. I meant there's a nice knockdown argument for you. It's all about the arguments with Humpty Dumpty. It's all about the competition. Glory means a nice knockdown argument. That's what glory is for hum to, to Humpty Dumpty. But he is the privileged one who has this information. He knows what he means by the word glory. Um, don't forget what he just said. If I'd meant that, I'd have said it, said Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty asserts that he is always in control of what he means. And at first it sounds in this context, the way that he scores a point on her, um, sounds in this context as if he merely is saying, I, I choose my words rather more carefully than you do. Um, I, when I asked, how old did you say you were? I meant what I said. If I had meant, how old are you? I'd have said that. Now we see him going, quite a step further. He is still, there's glory for you. He is saying just what he means. But now what he means is concealed. That's hidden. Nobody else can know what he means by there's glory for you <clears throat> until he explains it. And Alice objects. Glory doesn't mean a nice knockdown argument. That's, that's not the definition. If you look it up in the dictionary, right at the extreme end of sense, according to the Red Queen, um, that's not what you'll find the dictionary saying. That isn't the conventional meaning. That's not what everybody generally understands by the word glory. Humpty Dumpty, however, asserts an independent authority, an independent mastery over words, and therefore a significant sort of competitive edge over his interlocutor. When I use a word, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. Humpty Dumpty is in control of his language. Not just in the sense of he always is careful to make sure what he says is 
like what you will understand him to mean, right? Um, he maintains a dominance over his words so that he can dictate to his words what they mean. And therefore... Right, so now notice Alice's appeal. The question is whether you can make words mean so many different things. Is that, does that work? So you can, you're just going to independently decide that to you the word glory means this? You know, the question is whether you can make words mean so many different things. Is that, like, legal? Can you do that? Um, Humpty Dumpty says, turns it around, the question is, which is to be master? Now, of course, we can take that in one of two ways. Um, he has been searching for mastery over Alice throughout. It's all about the competition for Humpty Dumpty, right? Um, he is maintaining his own mastery. Um, she has to come asking him, smiling contemptuously at her, right? Um, speaking in a scornful tone to her. Uh, he maintains mastery over her because what he has said cannot be understood. Remember back to the riddles. That's how he's been interpreting things all along. Communication is intrinsically competitive. How can you be certain to win that competition when it is in fact logically impossible for your interlocutor to understand you? Because you are asserting independent and idiosyncratic definitions for these words that they cannot possibly understand unless you, until he tells you. And so therefore, mastery. His mastery over the words and his mastery over Alice as well. Alice says, I, can you make words mean so many different things? Um, she, once again, is being indirect and suggesting her, her question is about the you. Can, can you do that? Like it's, that's not how language works. That's not how social interchange works. In fact, if everybody acted like that, nobody could possibly understand anybody. If I just, you know, made a whole new set of definitions for every word because I was asserting my mastery over language, I would never successfully communicate with anyone else again. Can, can you make words mean so many different things? As we see, Humpty Dumpty is going to interpret her question, can you make words mean so many different things? Literally again. Um, but he's going to shift it around to talk about his relationship with the words. Does he have the capability to compel the words to mean so many different things? Is his relationship... Is his mastery over words sufficient that he can make them sit up and take notice like that? Yes. Yes, he can. <laughs> right. Alice was too much puzzled to say anything. So after a minute, Humpty Dumpty began again. They've a temper, some of them, particularly verbs. They're the proudest adjectives you can do anything with, but not verbs. However, I can manage the whole lot of them. Impenetrability. That's what I say. Would you tell me, please, said Alice, what that means? Now you talk like a reasonable child, said Humpty Dumpty, looking very much pleased. I meant by impenetrability, that we've had enough of that subject, and it would be just as well if you'd mention what you mean to do next, as I suppose you don't mean to stop here all the rest of your life. It's a great deal to make one word mean, Alice said in a thoughtful tone. When I make a, work, a word do a lot of work like that, said Humpty Dumpty, I always pay it extra. Oh, said Alice. She was too much puzzled to make any other remark. Ah, you should see him come round me of a Saturday night, Humpty Dumpty went on, wagging his head gravely from side to side, for to get their wages, you know. Alice didn't venture to ask what he paid them with, and so, you see, I can't tell you. Love that line. Once again, Lewis Carroll breaks the fourth wall and addresses the, the reader of the story directly. Um, explaining, anticipating an interrupting question. What does Humpty Dumpty pay? Um, what do they get paid in? What is the currency in which you pay 
words, which apparently work for him, right? Um, and the narrator tells us proactively, Alice didn't ask, so I have no idea. I can't tell you. Um, the anticipation of an interruption is interesting in the immediate context, as we'll see. Um, but uh, also emphasizing Alice's puzzlement and also lack of curiosity. Alice, uh, Alice seems by this time to kind of want out of this conversation, <laughs> right? This has been a very unpleasant conversation um, with this person who is alternating between taking offense at things that she says and then um, trying to score points against her, right? The competitiveness, the mastery throughout. Um, now he's boasting about his mastery over the words. Again, this here, um, when he's talking about uh, being able to manage the words, this is him still responding to Alice's question. The question is, can you make words do that? And then he proceeds to illustrate how he can make, you know, he is the employer of the words. Uh, he can... Uh, he can make them mean whatever they want. And indeed, sometimes he can make them work overtime as he makes the word impenetrability work overtime, which is ironic because impenetrability is a very long word, right? So it's a, a lot of syllables in impenetrability. Um, it's the kind of word, I think, that a child of Alice's age might be quite proud at knowing because it's such a long and complicated word. Um, but, um, anyway, uh, not content with a simple, what, impenetrability, seven syllable word, um, he makes even the seven syllable word do over time, right? And mean a quite long and complicated thing. As Alice remarks, that's a great deal to make one word mean. Um, uh, Humpty Dumpty is not just master of words, he's uh, a hard taskmaster of words, even though he admits that he pays it extra. Um, this image of the words coming, gathering around him every Saturday night to get their wages uh, is, uh, is rather delightful. Um, yeah. Okay. Notice how he has brought Alice into line. Impenetrability. That's what I say. To which she responds, would you tell me, please, what that means? The politeness of her question. Her compliance with his insistence that she can't possibly understand his words without asking him to explain what the words mean. Um, he has now gotten the upper hand that he has wanted through this whole conversation. And she seems to be um, attempting. Um, he seems to be attempting, she seems to be attempting to leave, I think, as quickly as possible. However, um, she does finally suggest, seeing how pleased he is at being uh, able to explain words and the meaning of words to her. She s asks him to explain Jabberwocky because there were many words in that poem that she didn't understand. And so now you see Alice has come to a new theory about Jabberwocky. She wasn't sure about it at all before. And now she's thinking, well, perhaps those words that seem so strange are words like Humpty Dumpty is using, where a particular um, meaning is being asserted and I don't have, you know, may maybe there are reasons why I couldn't figure that out, right? So, let us ask the master of words to explain all of these hard words. She recites the first stanza. Can you recite the first stanza? Let's recite the first stanza. Twas brillig. And the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe, 
all mimsy where the Bora goes and the Momraths outgrabe. Okay, that's as far as she gets, right? That's enough to begin with, Humpty Dumpty interrupted. There are plenty of hard words there. Brillig means four o'clock in the afternoon, the time when you begin broiling things for dinner. That'll do very well, said Alice. And slithy? Well, slithy means lithe and slimy. Lithe is the same as active. You see, it's like a portmanteau. There are two meanings packed up into one word. I see it now, Alice remarked thoughtfully. And what are toves? Well, toves are something like badgers. They're something like lizards. And they're something like corkscrews. They must be very curious-looking creatures. They are that, said Humpty Dumpty. Also, they make their, their nests under sundials. Also, they live on cheese. And what's to gyre and to gimbal? To gyre is to go round and round like a gyroscope. To gimbal is to make holes like a gimblet. Okay, the exposition of Humpty Dumpty is extremely authoritative. Now, first, we must begin with this very important idea of the portmanteau word. This is a metaphor that, again, both Lewis and Tolkien allude back to at several points. Um, it's like a portmanteau. Um, of course, you know uh, what a portmanteau is. A portmanteau is uh, a, a one of those old-fashioned suitcases that, um, instead of like a many modern, most modern suitcases, really, um, which have like the large cavity and a zip top that flips open, right? And then you zip the top of it shut. A portmanteau has the two equal sides, and then they come together and are clam you know, get get uh, clamped together in the middle. Um, so you've got this this metaphor of the two separate halves being brought and joined together, right, in the portmanteau. Two meanings packed into one word. Um, so slithy is a portmanteau word of lithe and slimy. Um, now, the thing is, if this were all, if this were the only piece of exposition that Humpty Dumpty did of Jabberwocky, it would be pretty compelling, actually, because once he points out that trend of portmanteau words um, that combine two other words, we can see many such examples. The familiar, the now familiar word chortle, which, of course, was... Um, uh, is has passed into common usage and has long since passed into common usage, but was another one of these strange new words uh, from the poem Jabberwocky. Chortle is clearly also a portmanteau word. What are the two words that are, what are the two meanings that are packed up into the one word chortle, do you think? I would, <clears throat> yes, I would suspect chuckle, chuckle is definitely one, um, and probably snort. Chuckle and snort, I think, is, is, is very likely the two words, right? So, like, once we have this concept, there are lots of other places, things, you know, other words that Humpty Dumpty does not allude to in the rest of the poem um, that we can begin to think of in this kind of a portmanteau way. Um, it does provide a kind of key to try to interpret some of um, some of the other words that we read in the poem. So that's very interesting, right? Um, that this does seem to be Lewis Carroll kind of showing us part of his technique in making up words. Um, that said, I'm not at all sure of his interpretation of the word slithy. Um, this concept of portmanteau words is a keeper. That's a that seems to be a perfectly legitimate, um, a perfectly legitimate uh, uh, concept. But I'm not real convinced that live and slimy are necessarily the two words. I mean, maybe I guess I don't know that much, and I don't know as much about toves as um, Humpty Dumpty uh, claims to know. Um, 
but uh, anyway, the actual application of the portmanteau concept to that word has never seemed extremely. Uh, I've never been a I'm, I'm not zero percent convinced, but I've never been a hundred percent convinced in that either. Um, but yeah, the question um, that Mo Dylan was asking, since Humpty Dumpty makes up his own word meanings, is he an unreliable dictionary here on the Jabberwocky words? I think we have to assume so, don't we? Um, Toves. Badgers, there's something like badgers, something like lizards, and something like corkscrews, and they make their nests under sundials, and they live on cheese. So that's a lot of detail of what a tove is. Um, what reason do we have to believe him? I, I think he's making this up. Um, we have two different patterns that he is showing in his own exposition here. One is simple word association. Brillig sounds like the word broiling a little bit, right? So there's broiling. He's, he's chosen an English word which is more similar to the word brillig than pretty much any other English word I can think of. Um, and so just because of the general similarity of the two words, he, he asserts a, a literal connection between them. Since you start broiling things for dinner at about four o'clock in the afternoon, brillig means four o'clock in the afternoon. Notice he's taking the syntactical cue as well. Twas brillig, right? Okay, so that's how the poem starts. So he says, so that the twas is telling you what time of day. It's setting the scene for the rest of the poem, right? Twas brillig. It's four o'clock in the afternoon, right, is how the poem begins. That seems to me unlikely that that's what brillig means. Um, that just because he starts, this poem starts with the word twas, that the logical, the word that comes next must be a time of day. It's possible that the poet is specifying the time of day at the beginning of the of the poem, but hardly completely necessary, I would say. Um, but based on the strength of this association, he asserts the identity. He's doing similar word association with slithy, right? Taking the words lithe and slimy and, and associating it with the both of them put together like a portmanteau. Similarly to Geyer and to Gimbal. Geyer seems easy, because Geyer is the first word, first syllable in the word gyroscope, so clearly to Geyer means to go round and round like a gyroscope. What else could it mean? And to Gimbal, well, that sounds like the word gimblet. Um, that is something that you poke holes in things with, so um, uh, so that's what to Gimbal must mean also. Again, just pure word association, which is not a great way to guess at the meanings of words, usually. Right? Um, I think that uh, I think that Tolkien would have found that particularly amusing as a philologist, as a philologist who frequently complained about people making exactly these kinds of word associations. And remember, if you've read Tolkien's Beowulf book, sorry, looking at my shelf for the Beowulf book, which is out of reach. Um, if you've read Tolkien's Beowulf book, his commentary on Beowulf, you may remember that he launches off on this at near the very beginning when we've got the the uh, the Walrod, the 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 whale, what is often translated whale road, um, as a kenning for the ocean. And Tolkien goes off on that, right? It's not road. It doesn't mean road. Um, and uh, and then he goes to explain what rad is and how it's related to road, but it's not the same thing as road, and that you can't do that kind of thing just because this. 
this Anglo-Saxon word sounds like a modern word, you can't just say um, that that's it's it's obviously it's obviously connected to it. Um, I think that. Um, uh, yeah, exactly. As uh, Mahed says, folk etymologies as opposed to those researched by prose. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, anyway, like, I, as I say, I think that T Tolkien would have been rather darkly amused was, uh, by Humpty Dumpty's exposition here as Humpty Dumpty's doing exactly what you're not supposed to do, but he's doing it very authoritatively. So again, as I said, there are two, that there, there are two patterns that we see that kind of word association, sound association, um, linking two words, the nonsense word and the known word, um, through, through sound association is one thing. The other thing is in the case of Toves, simply making stuff up, right? Um, Badgers, lizards, corkscrews, sundials, cheese. All of those things are associated with toves. And here again, I don't think there's any connection with the sound of the word. He's just... And we can see him brainstorming this. Something like badgers. There's something like lizards. Wait, is, is that a correction? I guess he's saying, no, they're not like badgers. They're like lizards instead. I mean, they're the first two things he says. And it sounds almost like the second thing is meant to be a replacement of the first one. Toves are something like badgers. They're something like lizards. Wait, which is it? A badger or a lizard? And they're something like corkscrews. Oh, oh it's a badger lizard corkscrew. Okay. Um, but his pauses seem to me to suggest... Um, uh, uh, seems to me to suggest that um, he's making this up as he goes along. That's what the pauses, I think, suggest. Um, also, and you know, we got the dashes, the pauses first, and then the alsos. Also, they make their nests under sundials. Also, they live on cheese. Oh, yeah, I just thought of something else. Uh, here... This seems to be, especially based on the pattern that we've seen before, this seems to be Humpty Dumpty, Humpty Dumpty simply asserting, making something up that Toves means. And we just saw him doing this with the words glory and impenetrability. Uh, so, yeah. Now, Alice accepts it. She's, oh, okay, great. She doesn't want to have an argument with him. So she's not going to fight, and she doesn't know what a Tove is anyway. Um... Uh, there, some of the things that she like, she, she, she quite likes his explanations in places that'll do very well. She says, um, she likes, I think how his resolution of Brillig into a time of day makes whole new sense of that first line. That'll do very well. I didn't know why it said twas Brillig. What is Brillig? And, you know, so not only what does Brillig mean, but what's the it? Right? What's the antecedent of the it? It was Brillig. What was Brillig? Right? Oh, but when you say it's four o'clock in the afternoon, that now it makes sense. Twas four o'clock in the afternoon. Sure. Great. Twas tea time. Right? Excellent. Okay. Um, it works for her because it helps to make things make sense. And she seems to like the portmanteau word idea. I see it now. Right. Okay. Now I have a key with which I can make sense of things. Um... Yes. Um, Alice now begins to contribute. And the wabe is the grass plot round a sundial, I suppose, said Alice, surprised at her own ingenuity. Ingenuity. She's making stuff up, too. He said that toves live under sundials. So... If they're gyring on the wabe, then the wabe must be the glass pot around a sundial. Oh, yeah. Great. Of course it is, says Humpty Dumpty. It's called wabe, you know, because it goes a long way before it, and a long way behind it, and a long way beyond it on each side, Alice added. Exactly so. She's catching on. 
now get notice just the pure sound association. And this is the silliest sound association of all, where he's not just associating Wabe with a particular word that might sound a little bit like that. He, he as uh, uh, he instead associates it with what, like the junction of two words, um, a long way before it and way behind it and way beyond it. That's the Wabe, right? Um, that is a tremendously silly associative etymology, but Alice is down with it, right? She's, she's, she's picking up what he's putting down at this point. Well then, Mimsy is flimsy and miserable. There's another portmanteau for you. And a Borogov is a thin, shabby looking bird with its feathers sticking out all round, something like a live mop. And then Momraths, said Alice. I'm afraid I'm giving you a great deal of trouble. Well, a wrath is a sort of green pig, but mom, I'm not certain about. I think it's short for from home, meaning that they lost their way, you know. And what does outgrabe mean? Well, outgribing is something between bellowing and whistling with a kind of sneeze in the middle. However, you'll hear it done, maybe, down in the wood yonder. And when you've he once heard it, you'll be quite content. Who's been repeating all that hard stuff to you? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Arthur says his daughter keeps telling me nobody says, uh, uh, says that. Well, oh, about being down with it? Yeah, I just did, Arthur. You, you heard me. I, I said it just now. So somebody says it. There you go. Um, yeah. Um, yes, and Mahid, you're right. The corkscrews work with Geyer and Gimbal. It does hold together a little bit. Maybe that's what made him think about uh, uh, about uh, corkscrews. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that Mimsy, as a portmanteau of flimsy and miserable, um, maybe. I'm not saying it doesn't work at all. Uh, and he seems to bear it out with uh, his, the explanation that immediately follows, right? A thin, shabby-looking bird with its feathers sticking out all round like a live mop. Uh, that does sound both flimsy and miserable, so I, I guess it kind of works. Um, <laughs> a wrath is a sort of green pig. All right. Um, and then Moam, he does the same thing as with Wabe, Right the sound association, not even with a single word, but with a phrase. It's short for from home. Uh, outgribing, he tries to do something like a portmanteau here, something between a bellowing and a whistling with a kind of sneeze in the middle. Um, so it's like three different sounds all combined together, almost packed together like a portmanteau, but the word itself is not a portmanteau word, exactly. He, again, is just sort of asserting this, right? Um, I, I, like Humpty Dumpty does, because Humpty Dumpty is the master of the words. And so he doesn't know what this poem means, but he can assert what it means. Um, remember that... So here we see kind of the next level of the thought experiment that is the Jabberwocky poem. I was saying when we read the poem originally that the Jabberwocky poem functions almost like a kind of thought experiment. Let me see if I can communicate to you using words that neither of us knows. All right, so I will... You will not recognize the words, and yet... I am going to convey meaning into your mind, right? I'm going to see if, um, again, it's, it's, it's an experiment in the sense of like, where in does meaning lie? Does meaning lie? Do you need the dictionary in order to convey meaning? Can you only convey meaning by using words, which, you know, whose meaning is mutually agreed upon, you know, by everybody involved by the, by the, the, the writer and the reader? Um, or can you convey meaning otherwise than that? Um, this is, uh, 
seems to be the kind of experiment that Jabberwocky is. But now look what happens next. When somebody goes to that text and defines the words on their own ground, they are making it now, Humpty Dumpty has now made it into a particular story. He has now explained the first stanza. And we could do like a prose narration. By the way, I um, I strongly dislike, strongly dislike the fact that the, in, the illustrator of Alice in Wonderland illustrates the poem when it first appears with figures consistent with Humpty Dumpty's explanation of them. I hate that. Um, that should not be, uh, it just, I think that's, that's like so very wrong as a way to approach this. Um, that is when you first read the poem, you should not be looking at an illustration of a badger lizard corkscrew combination creature, right? Um, that there, that poem should never be illustrated at first. It should be left to work on its own. And then Humpty Dumpty's assertions layered onto it later on to then see again experimentally now what has happened. Um, uh, now what has happened? <sighs> Did Carol approve of Tennille's illustrating that? I don't know the blow by blow of that whole thing. I know that Carol was not a fan of Tennille's illustrations and didn't want him to illustrate the second volume but the publishers insisted and Carol submitted. Um, but uh, I don't think either of them really enjoyed the collaboration, to be honest. Um, uh, but um, anyway, yeah, it's my least favorite Tennille illustration, not because I think he does a terrible job of illustrating what Humpty Dumpty describes, but again, he shouldn't be. Um, anyway, whatever. Uh, so this the second layer of meaning, the layer of meaning meaning that Humpty Dumpty asserts and places onto it tells us something about serves as a kind of um parody, I suppose it's a sort of parody, a sort of parody of the act of the reader, right? Um, the reader, you know, the, the listener to the poem, in this case, Humpty Dumpty, asserts authority over the meaning. I can tell you what these words mean. I can explain. Um, and once I've explained it, you'll, this poem will no longer be a mystery to you. Um, he is going to crystallize it into one shape, merely asserting on his own authority that it is correct. Um, and yet those assertions are based on a complete making stuff up in part and pretty wild and loose free sound associations on the other hand, right? That is, and in neither case is there much real authority, much actual authority involved. Um, again, Alice, she likes it. She's enjoying it. Um, she accepts it. And that makes me kind of further uncomfortable, actually. Um, Alice's uh, acceptance, uh, her accession to Humpty Dumpty's authority uh, in this case, seems to me, I don't know, uh, sharpens my discomfort uh, with it. Um, so if the poem is itself a kind of experiment, I think that Humpty Dumpty provides a, a rather parodic, extreme and parodic example of one potential outcome to that experiment. Because here's the thing. It would be hard for the author to come back to Humpty Dumpty and say, no, that's not what I meant at all. Because 
there is no, the nature of the experiment was that there is no accepted definition for those words. So why can't Humpty Dumpty be right? He's master, after all. And aren't we all like that sometimes? Asserting mastery over what we hear and what those things that we hear mean, right? Uh, Humpty Dumpty is sure certain that he knows. Um, yeah, Mahed says that uh, Humpty Dumpty is a literature professor then. Yeah, and I think that um, both C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, I believe, saw Humpty Dumpty as a kind of parody of what they do as literature, as reader of literature uh, in both of their cases, as philologist in Tolkien's case, and kind of vague amateur philologist in some ways in Lewis's case. Um, somebody was interested in it in any case. Um, and they, I think, both took that joke in good fun. Um, you may remember my favorite reference to this incident that Tolkien makes and I'm blanking on it. Somebody look it up. It's on, it's in on fairy stories. One of the words when he, when he coins a word, one of the words that we use all the time, I don't think it's you catastrophe. Is it subcreation? It might be subcreation. He speaks of arrogating to himself the power of Humpty Dumpty in order to define a word, right? To assert a private definition. Uh, for a new word. And so he uh, self-effacingly characterizes this as arrogating to himself the power of Humpty Dumpty. Um, if somebody could look that up, I would be gratified. I want to pause to look it up right now. But if you have an electronic version of On Fairy Stories, look up Humpty Dumpty and you'll find the sentence. I'm pretty sure that's where it is. Um, but anyway... Uh, as I say, both of them like this. And again, you can see the issues that are being dealt with here, the, 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 the kinds of reactions, both reactions of ignorance, like in philology, the kind of sound association thing, and uh, the, um, uh, and the, um, the sort of authority claimed, you know, by a certain, um, a certain, certain, authoritative figures within these fields, right? Um, and both of them get kind of delightfully wrapped up together into Humpty Dumpty the Egg, uh, and they both loved the joke. Thank you, JJ. I figured you could come up with that. There it is, the sentence. For my present purpose, I require a word which shall embrace both the subcreative art in itself and a quality of strangeness and wonder in the expression derived from the image a quality essential to fairy story. I propose, therefore, to arrogate myself, to myself, the powers of Humpty Dumpty, and use fantasy for this purpose. That is. That's it. That's it. Very good. Um, so, you see, he's doing exactly what Humpty Dumpty does. He's taking a word which hasn't established meaning. There is a meaning for the word fantasy, several meanings for the word fantasy. But he is arrogating to himself the power of Humpty Dumpty by reassigning to the word fantasy a new meaning. And you'll notice this second layer joke that he places upon that, right? Um, I require a word which shall embrace both the subcreative art in itself and a quality of strangeness and wonder in the expression derived from the image. And he wants to combine those like a portmanteau, packing two meanings into one word, and he's going to assign those combined meanings to an established word and give it a definition that it's never had before. And so he is setting himself up as Humpty Dumpty. Um, so again, you can see, you can see, you can see how much Tolkien loved this passage, uh, how much Tolkien uh, w was amused by this character, and even in. Um, in doing this, like as he is himself doing this thing, which Lewis Carroll is poking fun at, right? Um, you know, he is, uh, he doesn't stop doing it, right? Um, but he makes fun of himself while he does it. Um, I think uh, uh, that's, uh, that's a lot of fun. Okay, next is um, poetry. 
we don't have time for the poem, but let's read the intro here. Um, she has just told him that she's had a lot of re poetry recited to him. As to poetry, you know, said Humpty Dumpty, stretching out one of his great hands, I can repeat poetry as well as other folk if it comes to that. <laughs> oh, it needn't come to that, Alice hastily said, hoping to keep him from beginning. The piece I'm going to repeat, he went on without noticing her remark, was written entirely for your amusement. Alice felt that in that case she really ought to listen to it. So she sat down and said, thank you, rather sadly. <laughs> so Alice, as if captured by Vogons, is forced to listen to Humpty Dumpty's poem, which she quite does not want to hear. Oh, it needn't come to that. I love her taking his phrase and turning it. She Notice how she's doing to him, what he was doing to her, literalizing his words. Um, if it comes to that is, again, another one of those figures of speech that you kind of throw out. And she takes it literally. It needn't come to that, right? Um, let's not do the poetry recitation. Um, and... Uh, um, And then he guilt trips her, again with the social cues. The piece I'm going to repeat was written entirely for your amusement, thereby socially obligating her to listen to it, um, as he no doubt well knew. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, JJ said, I always wondered if Gandalf's good morning bit at the beginning of, of The Hobbit was somewhat of a self-parody. Yeah, and... A little bit, um, and in these directions too, right? Um, what a, you know, uh, what a, what a, what a, what a, what a, what's the phrase? Great deal of, um, what a great number of things you do use good morning for, Gandalf says to Bilbo, right? Um, again, uh, there, there's sort of an implication, right? That uh, Bilbo had better pay that phrase extra. Right. Um, if he's going to make it do all that, all that much work. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, excellent. Um, <laughs> JJ says, I don't know that I've ever sympathized with a literary character so much as I sympathized with Alice here. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I love Humpty Dumpty's poem. This whole performance that is coming up. Um, I am not going to rush into it because we only have like two minutes left and um, there's way too much to savor in this poem. But uh, let's, um, let's, because there is, at, this is in its way one of the stranger poems in the entire poem, in the entire book. It is, um, uh, stranger in its way than Jabberwocky, um, we will see Lewis Carroll once again playing with conventions and thereby toying with his audience in rather in rather delightful ways. All right, but we'll do the poem. We'll do the poem next time. Um, so look forward to next week um, when I get to subject all of you uh, to poetry again, and then we will move on. Uh, so do go ahead and read chapter seven, the lion, the, oh, the lion and the unicorn, um, uh, in which we get to meet another of my favorite characters. We've met the red queen. Uh, we talked with her in the garden um, and we uh, saw the red king sleeping, who might be dreaming this entire sequence. Um, and of course, then we just recently met the white queen. So we're going to get the white king um, uh, here in this next chapter in another conversation uh, that I just love. Um, okay. Thank you, everybody. We are coming. We're winding down. I still think we might make it to the end of Through the Looking Glass by the end of the calendar year here this year. We'll see. I, it's my goal. I think we might make it. Um, no promises, but I'm hopeful. Anyway, thanks, everybody. Good night now.